Hi everyone, I'm Laura. Welcome back to our video series talking about deep dive into yoga. We are moving through the ebook and right now we are on number 11 talking about the different forms of yoga and I kind of debated whether or not to move this up higher in the text because I feel like it's something that I want newer yoga students to grasp and understand that there are so many different ways to practice yoga, way more than what we are exposed to in the Western world um, and in traditional yoga studios. There's so many different ways to practice yoga that look very different that might be a little bit confusing at first. But this is what we're going to talk about, starting with karma yoga. And karma is a word that a lot of times we have heard in popular culture, but karma yoga is about your yoga practice being your service or your action in the world. Uh, think like volunteer work, but it can also be your paid employment. If you, I work in healthcare, and a lot of times going to work, thinking about the energy that I'm going to put toward my patients in service to them, supporting them in their healing process, helping them through this. The effort that I put into my workday is very much a part of my service and my action within the world. Usually this takes on the context of thinking that it is um, a volunteer work, that you're not getting paid compensation for it. And when you get to a certain stage in your life, it definitely can be in, um, when you get to retirement and you no longer have that job that is occupying the vast majority of your day, when we look at the, the stages of life and we move into that space of giving back, of passing down the knowledge, passing down the skills and experience and being of service with your time, that can be an evolution within the way that your yoga practice shows up in your life. So you could be a practicing yogi, a karma yogi, who thinks about the way that their actions um, or maybe even giving money to certain causes, creating that ripple effect. There's so many different ways to have that positive service out within the world, sharing your gifts, your skills, your abilities with the people around you to support them in their life. The next one is bhakti yoga. So this is the form of yoga that is based on devotional practice. And this is something that I was exposed to when I went to Yogaville, when I stayed at their ashram for a month. They would do devotional practices. They had a lot of shrines on the property. And you could go to what was called a puja, which is a, a devotional practice. And they would do offerings and this beautiful ceremony that would be showing devotion to a certain deity or um, it was also described to me as a process of showing your gratitude toward the enlightened being. And at that ashram, it was Swami Sivana, or Sachidananda, Swami Sachidananda at the Yogaville ashram. And it was a devotional practice, not toward the Swami himself, but toward the attainment of enlightenment, toward that kind of core piece of his being. That's what the devotional practice was directed toward. And I had a really great conversation one day with one of the women that was his follower for many years and was one of the um, workers at the ashram and I was able to speak with her about what the process of the devotional practice was like because it was so different to me. I really didn't understand what was happening, why it was happening, um, and me being who I am, I have to ask questions about everything and find out more and find out why. So that was a great enlightening um, conversation to start to understand what a bhakti yoga practice looks like. There's also a well-known festival that happens out, I think it's in Joshua Tree, out in the western part of the United States where they do a bhakti yoga festival. I would love to make it out there one year for that festival because they have all sorts of 
um, kirtan and group meditations and all of these different devotional practices. Some people have specific deities that they are um, practicing and showing their devotion toward. So hopefully one day I get to go out there. But if you have been to a bhakti yoga festival or gathering, or maybe you have experience with bhakti yoga yourself, I would love to hear about that, hear about what that experience is like. Okay, the next form of yoga is yana yoga. And this is the attainment of knowledge through studying, very specifically studying the scriptures. And I think I organized the ebook well because we were just talking about gaining knowledge and we're going to move on the next section. We're going to be talking about some of the foundational texts that yoga students can learn from. Um, so yana yoga would be if you just devoted your practice toward studying the texts and understanding the philosophy and gaining that knowledge. So it's like this very cerebral approach to yoga um, that looks totally different, right? So we're not doing yoga poses. We're not doing breath work. It is the study of scripture and knowledge, but still considered a form of yoga. And the last one is the one that we are possibly more familiar with, Raja Yoga. And Raja Yoga is the royal path or the royal discipline. And I created another page to kind of break this down because it can be a slightly confusing concept here because Raja Yoga being called the royal path, it's the way to get to enlightenment, but it is also the practice of samadhi, of getting to enlightenment. So it is both the goal and the journey at the same time, right? Leave it to yoga to give us like a a little bit of a mind teaser there. So Raja Yoga, the process is the path to get to enlightenment, but it is also the attainment of enlightenment. Um, these are a lot of the fundamental yogic techniques that really focus on meditation. So I've read so many different things about this form of yoga, but one of the things that I hear from all different sources, all different lineages, is the emphasis on the state of meditation to be that stepping stone into enlightenment. So all of the different tools being implemented to get to that state of meditation. And this is where we start to see uh, the more kind of classical components of yoga that we have learned in the eight limbs. You have your asana practice, your postures, your pranayama, practicing the yamas and the niyamas within yourself and in relationship to those around you withdrawing the senses with pratyahara, working on concentration, but all of those things are actually used as a vehicle to get to the state of meditation because the state of meditation is that stepping stone into enlightenment, into freedom, into union, however you want to describe that experience. Um, but this is a very old version of the practice. So when I say asana, it's probably the seated meditation pose, right? If you go back to the Hatha Yoga Pratapika, which we will talk about in the next section, those core poses that they had were predominantly just seated poses, different variations of seated poses. So this is like a very boiled down version of yoga that does not have a lot of the modern trappings that have been added in. The, the fancier, more complex poses, the really intricate breath work, a lot of that is a modern addition to the practice of yoga that came much later. We could refer back to the timeline and the graphic that showed the lineage of yoga. So when we go back to the beginning, this was kind of the starting point, those really key foundational things of sitting in your posture, steadying your breath, drawing your attention in, and then making that transition into that different mental state of being in meditation. All right, so that's an overview of some of the, the lesser discussed versions of yoga, right? If you go on social media or if you pick up a book about yoga, very often it's going to be about the modern experience of the poses, the breath work, and maybe some of the other components, but very, very seldom do I hear 
yana yoga, bhakti yoga, or karma yoga talked about. Now, I listened to a wonderful podcast the other day. I mentioned the Let's Talk About Yoga podcast, and they were talking about how these are not separate entities, or they don't have to be. You could just practice bhakti yoga by itself, and that would be your yoga practice. But most people within their evolution of practicing yoga, there's this intertwining and there's this like weaving together and overlapping of these different components. You don't have to pick just one. I am only a bhakti yogi. I only do devotional practice. I only do puja. You can overlap these and intertwine them. So you might do some selfless service at some point. You might have a form of devotional practice like chanting that you like to do. Um, and then you might spend some time doing a yana yoga study into the text. At different points in your life, you might feel yourself leaning into different practices. Um, for sure, we probably go through phases where we lean more heavily into posture work um, or into meditative practices. So being aware of the way that your practice evolves and changes and how all of these things show up in different ways in your life and on your mat becomes this very interesting um, kind of watching how things unfold and how things evolve over time, especially as your knowledge of what yoga is expands. We are leaving behind that idea that yoga is just breathing and stretching on your mat. It is all of these different things. All right, so I hope you have learned something in this section. In the next section, we're going to be looking at the study of yoga texts and where you can gain more insight into the philosophy of yoga. If you haven't downloaded the text companion for these videos yet, you can go over to my website, laurajyoga.com. And when you sign up for my email newsletter, you're going to immediately get an email sent to you that will have the free download in it. And you'll also get every couple of days, I will send you an email with some helpful resources, some other downloads, things to support your practice and to help you to deepen even further. So thank you for being here and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.